We've had our Komodo Stormtroop for quite some time now, but we can't talk about the camera like we normally do with our reviews, as technically the Stormtrooper edition is still in beta, so we will have to wait until we get our hands on the final production black units. Everything filmed on the Komodo in this video was captured on Stormtrooper units running beta software 1.2.2. If you're after a red Komodo full production unit, I'm happy to announce pre-orders have just started, so if you want to pick one up, head over to our site via the link in the description below. However, we can talk about the image and the workflow that the Komodo features. So let's take a look at what we've managed to shoot with the red Komodo so far. The Komodo was originally conceived and designed as a crash camera for high-end motion picture use and as a B or C camera to productions with RED's existing DSMC2 line on it when a small and compact body is needed. The objective of the Komodo originally was for the camera to capture these scenes the best it could while also being small, easy to power and feature the same look and feel of the DSMC2 cameras. Though its price point has attracted a much larger range of end users than RED aimed to target with this camera such as people wanted to pick up their first cinema camera or dip their toes into the wonderful ecosystem RED has crafted. First off the bat, before we get into anything, I just want to say that if you are new to RED, I would strongly suggest signing up for RED user. This forum has been about for years and is the go-to place to chat to other users about anything filmmaking and RED related. It is also worth joining the RED Komodo Facebook group, as again, it is a really good resource for rig inspiration, as well as seeing what awesome work people are producing with the camera, as well as so much more. We wanted to shoot some test footage out and about, so we headed down south to Shoreham and Beachy Head to see what this camera can capture, and we got really lucky with the weather. We had two Komodos with us so all the footage you are seeing here is filmed on them using the latest 1.2.2 beta firmware. We shot on a few different lenses, the Sigma 18-35 and 7200 f2.8 Sport, the Zeiss Otis 28 and 55mm and an EMEA 45mm Seco C. We shot a mix of handheld and on a set of sticks. It was great to get some time out with the camera shooting and the camera is great to operate. The menus are so much snappier than on the DSMC2 bodies and changing exposure is fast and enabling focus assist is also really easy. However, I do wish there were some more buttons on the side of the camera which you could assign for exposure and focusing tools for when getting to the top screen is a bit more difficult. Otherwise, the form factor of the camera is really nice. With a battery draw of around 37 watt hours, we managed to run on a single night 8 watt hour vlog the entire shoot only having to switch out right at the very end. I've also seen people getting roughly an hour and a half out of a single Canon BP955, which are exactly 37 watt hours, which would suggest the power draw isn't quite as high as 37 watt hours. From the footage that we had seen before actually shooting with the Komodo, it has looked impressive. The most impressive thing being the color. After shooting what we have with the camera, it's safe to say that the image is fantastic for a camera of this price point. The camera does a really nice job at reproducing tonal range and I did wonder if motion would look a bit different with the global shutter than I'm used to but I actually think it doesn't make too much of a difference. The motion of people moving still looks natural but you have all the benefits of a global shutter when it comes to faster motion shots. Exposing correctly is really important with any camera, however with RED cameras, if you want to get the most out of them you really need to understand how the exposure tools work on them. It does feature both false color and a histogram, which are handy to have, but these both take ISO into account. 
So really, you need to use either one of these exposure tools while also using the RGB traffic lights tool. This tool is great because it is using the raw image data off of the sensor, which is unaffected by what ISO you are set to or what light you have applied. When about 2% of the image pixels for a particular color channel have become clipped in the highlights or lost in the shadows, the corresponding traffic lights will turn on. Both this and a histogram are on the main screen of the camera, and that's good because these are vital to use when shooting. One thing worth quickly mentioning is how and why to black balance. If you are unfamiliar with a black balance, this feature is only really available on these higher end video and cine cameras, and it is basically calibrating the sensor for no light or true black. Black shading works by measuring the pattern of fixed noise on your sensor, storing that information in your camera's memory, and then removing it out of your footage, leaving only random noise behind. It also does the same thing when it comes to the pixels. There are a few key times to execute a black balance, so it's definitely worth getting into the habit of doing them. It's really easy to do. Just go into the camera's menu system, maintenance, and then calibrate. Just make sure you have the port cap on the front of the body. CMOS sensors don't need to be black balanced as much as older sensor types, but there isn't anything negative about getting into the habit of doing this pretty regularly. Having a good set of quality NDs or a variable ND is really important for anybody who shoots video but with the Red Komodo, they are even more so, and there are some awesome options to choose from. You, of course, can get your standard variable ND, of which I would recommend picking up the Polar Pro VND, which is great for this style of ND. For our test footage, however, we use the Tiffin variable ND. However, I would personally prefer picking up one of the two mount options that are available for Komodo. The first is from Canon. This RF to EF adapter offers autofocus compatibility, but also allows you to use a rear mounted variable ND, which gives you 1.5 to nine stops of ND. The only downside of this is that there is no clear option on it, but this adapter is decently affordable and lightweight. The second option is from Kipatai. Kipatai makes both a set of regular adapters and revolver in both RF to PL and RF to EF. The DSMC2 revolver system has been incredibly popular with owners of those cameras, and they have now brought the same system over to Komodo. This is a very well-built adapter and the optical quality of the NDs is great. The revolver uses a cartridge wheel that features different stops of ND. Using regular NDs over variable means that you don't get the same color shift, vignetting or cross polarization artifacts that can be present when using a variable ND. You can get the revolver in locking EF or PL and another key benefit of this adapter over the Canon is the ability to attach this chin strap with these adapters so you can eliminate as much play in the mount as possible without needing a top or bottom plate. Kipatai offers three different cartridges which all have different strengths of NDs in and you can also get a diffusion version too. In our follow-up video, we'll be exploring these more so make sure you subscribe for that. The Komodo has a new Super 35 sensor which is the first from RED to feature a true global shutter. The sensor has a maximum resolution of 6144 by 3240 pixels, with a photo site size of 4.4 microns and a sensor size of 27.03 millimeters by 14.25 millimeters, which gives it a 30.56 millimeter diagonal. This is a nice size for a Super 35 camera, as it is a similar size to traditional 3 perf. A lot of Super 35 lenses were built for a 31mm image circle, so you shouldn't have any issues with coverage, apart from lenses which were built for the era of standard 35, like the Cook 18 to 100, or for APS-C like the Sigma 18 to 35, which may have a slight issue, for example. We've added the camera to the lens tool, so if you want to see if your current lenses can cover the Komodo sensor, head over to our tool via the link in the description. A photo site size of 4.4 microns is pretty good and should give more dynamic range than a helium, but less than a dragon. However, the global shutter will likely have an effect here. Most cinema cameras have integrated rolling shutters for a long time. As an electronic shutter, a rolling shutter almost emulates the way a mechanical shutter passes down the sensor. That paired with a loss of sensitivity or dynamic range when switching to a global shutter made fast rolling shutters a really good choice for cinema cameras. Red claims that the global shutter in the Komodo comes with no loss in dynamic range, which is fantastic if true. Rolling shutters aren't ideal for anything fast paced or with a lot of motion, such as shots with, from within a car with the streets outside whizzing by. Ultimately, every vertical line would become skewed. However, with a global shutter, these concerns go away, which is great for these kinds of scenarios. This is because this kind of shutter exposes all of your pixels simultaneously. Red being red and tied so heavily into cinema, we believe they have incorporated a global shutter into the Komodo for this very reason, 
to throw as a B, C, or crash cam into lots of situations where a rolling shutter is just less suitable. However, what I'm not sure of is if Red have foreseen the wave of users that will have Komodo as an A camera, and for which the slight extension of dynamic range and more natural motion of a rolling shutter may be of benefit. So it would be nice to see a switch in the camera between the two modes. Another benefit of global shutters is for use with flash bulbs, as every photo site on the sensor is opened for exposure simultaneously, it eliminates the chances of split framing. When it comes to dynamic range, Jared has posted images online comparing the Komodo to a Helium. The images show a few things, such as the Komodo has much nicer black levels than a Helium and controls CMOS smear, which is the lines coming out of the highlights to the left of the frame in a much better way. When looking at the chart, it could be argued that Komodo has 16 plus stops of dynamic range, and that's likely going to be claimed by RED. However, real world, it looks like it's around 13, which is good for a camera of this size and comparable to Helium. We've also conducted our regular test of under and over exposure tests with three of RED's DSMC2 cameras, a Gemini, Helium, and Monstro. So we can see how the Komodo stacks up against its bigger brothers. We've done a bunch of these recently for new cameras like the A7S III and Canon C70. So if you want to compare the Komodo to those, you can find the videos to those tests via the link in the description. And if you want us to do any comparisons in the future, let us know in the comments. For the under and over exposure tests, we lit for our chart using the built-in geoscopes on the DSMC2 cameras and then kept the exposure consistent across the cameras. When I refer to over or under exposure, that is referring to the mid-gray chip, which is the third from the right on the chart. And my skin is sat roughly one stop above that. We shot with our Otis 55mm across all four cameras and shot in R3D HQ in 6K 25P ISO 800 with the Komodo and the lowest available compression on each DSMC2 body at their maximum resolutions at 25p and ISO 800 again. For underexposure, we look for f2 and then close down the lens a stop at a time until we hit six stops under. The Gemini's low light mode would change these results, so we decided to only record in its regular mode. The Komodo holds color well down to minus five stops, but as you go through the stops, the image gets more and more green. I would say this is usable up to minus three stops and past that you're getting a lot of noise and green color shifts. The Gemini has less color cast overall and shifts more purple as you go through the stops. This is also usable down to minus three stops. The Helium performs very similarly and has a bit more of a purple shift and the Monstro is the best with the least amount of color shift and noise. For our overexposure tests, we pushed the cameras to go six stops overexposed. We lit for f16 and then opened up the lens a stop at a time until we hit six stops over. With the Komodo at three stops over, color is still held really well, but my skin is starting to break. At plus four stops over, colors start shifting and skin is getting unusable. The Gemini handles this a little better with skin breaking at four stops, not three, and color being held a little bit better. Helium performs pretty much the same as Gemini and the Monstro performs in between the two when it comes to my skin, but better than all in regards to color rendition. With our ISO tests, we lit for T2 ISO 800 and then closed down our lens as we stepped up the ISO range. The Komodo features no noise reduction in camera like other cameras at its price point, and this can be seen as either a positive or negative. It's a positive because this means you can dictate the amount of noise reduction you want to do in post, and it's negative if you are wanting a faster turnaround and not wanting to do noise reduction in post. When you are processing your R3D footage in Resolve or Premiere, you can enable chroma noise reduction. However, if you want to do some more robust noise reduction, I would suggest using Resolve's fantastic built-in system. When you bring the footage into Resolve, you need to make sure that your decode quality is set correctly, otherwise your playback will not show the noise reduction properly. You can do this by going into the Camera Raw tab and then selecting Full Res Premium. Here is a side-by-side -side of the image with no noise reduction, chroma noise reduction, and chroma noise reduction with Resolve processing also. Anyway, back to the tests. When shooting in RAW, this test is basically the same as our underexposure test. As you go up the ISO range from 400, you can see the image starting to shift green. Up to 3200, I would say the footage is pretty usable. However, above this, you will need to introduce some more chroma reduction and fix some of the color issues in post. This camera really does love light, uh, as do other RED cameras. So really, you wanna be shooting as close to ISO 800 as possible to get the best and cleanest results. Like RED's previous cameras, the Komodo features an optical low pass filter, or OLPF for short. However, unlike previous cameras, this isn't interchangeable. An OLPF, also known as an anti-aliasing filter, is used on a lot of Bayer sensors to counter moiré. With the low light and standard low pass filters in DSMC2, they didn't have an anti-reflective layer. So when a lens was stopped down, usually past f5.6, and pointed directly at a bright point source, 
the light would reflect off of the sensor to the ORPF and back to the sensor multiple times, creating a magenta dot pattern around the point source, as shown here. This was mitigated with the skin tone filter, which had an anti-reflective layer sandwiched between its two polarizing layers. Komodo seems to behave similarly to the skin tone filter with no sign of the magenta orb or dot pattern artifact. However, even with the included OLPF, you can see some aliasing when shooting our optical alignment chart here. Fred have said that this OLPF is a mix of the skin tone and low light filter. When it comes to the different frame rate options, you can shoot up to 40 FPS in 6K, 50 FPS in 5K, 60 FPS in 4K, and up to 120 frames per second in 2K, all in R3D. We think this will be acceptable to the crowd of pro users who are going to be using it as a B or C camera, as they will likely have the budget to get Phantoms or DSMC2 bodies on set when higher frame rates are required. But the independent crowd may long for some slightly improved options, which other cameras on the market like the Komodo can do. As with the rest of Red's lineup, the Komodo crops in on the sensor every time you change your resolution, as it's raw. So when compared to full frame 17x9 on the Venice, you will have a crop factor of roughly 1.34 times in 6K, 1.61 times in 5K, 2.01 times in 4K, and 4.02 times in 2K. Obviously, the higher resolutions look better, but the 2K 120 still looks really detailed, and as long as you aren't underexposing your shots, will still look very nice. Like I mentioned in the intro, the Komodo has been designed to be able to fit into existing DSMC2 productions, but how does it actually match with the existing DSMC2 sensor range? So using the test footage that we shot earlier, we tried to match them as closely as we could in Resolve. We use the same Zeiss Otis 55mm across each camera, so the only variable is the camera itself. They don't take too much to get matched, so if you are looking at picking up the Komodo up to work alongside your DSMC2 camera, you really won't have to worry about it too much. The Komodo features phase detect autofocus, which is a huge addition for RED, as they haven't done this in a camera before. They've always used contrast base, which has been, quite frankly, pretty terrible. RED have spoken about this being a feature that will evolve and improve over time, as it's their first time around having pixels on a sensor dedicated to AF, and they need to optimize the firmware correctly. However, it will be a welcome addition to a camera that's main focus will be for fast paced action. The current state of the autofocus is actually very impressive and kind of surprised me. It's extremely usable and actually better than some of its competitors. There are several key pieces of software that surround the Komodo that are worth exploring. And if you have never processed R3D footage before, things can get a little confusing, but once you process a few clips, you'll probably grow to love it as we do. Before we get into the software side of things, let's take a quick look at R3D. One huge pull of the RED ecosystem is their compressed RAW codec, R3D. However, this has been implemented slightly differently in the Komodo. This is one of the key selling points of the camera when compared to other cameras in its price bracket or of similar form factor being 6K 16-bit compressed RAW. R3D is the most powerful RAW codec on the market as it compresses RAW mosaic data, leaving the decompression and ultimately the debare for, for post. Key settings such as ISO, color space, gamma space, and white balance are stored as metadata in a sidecar file. And because of this, it means that they can be altered non-destructively. In comparison to other RAW codecs, which are either uncompressed, resulting in massive increases in data, given the same resolution and frame rate, or partially debayered, prior to compression, resulting in an ability to be lossless in certain situations. One change from their previous cameras is a simplification of their compression ratios. Unlike the vast options of ratios you have with DSMC2, the Komodo now uses HQ, MQ, and LQ, aka low, medium, and high quality. This simplification is going to be a much nicer choice for end users and create a lot less confusion. RED haven't given us the exact data rates of each compression option at a given resolution, but from our tests in 6K, 17x9, 23.98 FPS with a 512GB CFast 2.0 card, you will get about 280 megabytes per second and around 30 minutes of recording in HQ, up to 175 megabytes per second and roughly 48 minutes of recording in MQ, and up to 110 megabytes per second and roughly one hour and 17 minutes of recording in LQ. Another big benefit of R3D is that pro users that are looking at Komodo as a B or C cam do not need to have to worry, or at least the worry is mitigated, about multiple codecs going through the, the edit pipeline, making the workflow much simpler. With recent additions of GPU acceleration, either through NVIDIA on PC or Metal on OS X, 6K RAW should also be much easier to edit on more affordable systems than ever before. You can also shoot in ProRes, 
And this will be handy for people who don't want the increased data rates of RAW or want a more streamlined workflow. When you switch between R3D and ProRes, you need to reboot the camera, which is a bit of a pain given its 27 second boot time. You can shoot in both 42HQ and regular 422 in UHD, 2K and Full HD. Frame rates depend on the format that you have selected. So while in 6K, you can record UHD up to 40 frames per second. In 6K widescreen, you can capture up to UHD 50 frames per second. In 5K, you can shoot DCI 4K up to 48 frames per second. In DCI 4K, you can shoot up to 60 frames per second. And lastly, you have 2K, which you can shoot up to 120 frames per second. Having the option for either R3D RAW or ProRes is awesome. ProRes will be handy if you want a slightly more streamlined post workflow or want to get more time out of your media. It also looks like the camera is denoising the ProRes footage, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, as the chroma noise reduction Red is doing here looks good and removes a step out of the workflow process. However, R3D is arguably one of the most important pieces of the RED camera puzzle, so if you can fit this into your workflow or production, I would say this is the better option out of the two. When it comes to processing your R3D footage, you have several options to choose from. However, before we look at that, if you have never shot a RED before, Let's look at how the file structure works and what file structure you will have when you offload your card. Each clip is put inside of an RDC folder which houses the R3D files that make up the clip, an RMD file which is your metadata sidecar and an, an RTM file which is used to generate the thumbnail for use in playback. The Komodo uses the FAT32 as its file structure system so the camera splits the clips into 2.15 gigabyte files within this file. However, when you bring the folder into anything that can read an R3D file, they will see this single clip as a single file. Also in this folder is an RMD file. This is really handy as you can make changes in any program that allows you to make non-destructive changes, save it to your metadata, AKA the RMD file. And then when you next bring it into a program that can read R3D, the changes will be there. This will also be really handy if you want to go back and remaster any old clips as you still have all the raw data there. CineX Pro is a free application that you can download from Red's site. Link in our description for that that allows you to view R3D files natively on your Windows or Mac system. CineX has been designed specifically for transcoding and pre-editorial image manipulation for R3D footage. It's also a non-destructive application. So this means that you can make image adjustments while preserving the original raw data. If you want us to do a larger walkthrough of the Red CineX program, let us know in the comments below. When it comes to Premiere Pro, you can simply import your files as you normally do. The main thing to know when it comes to processing R3D files is how to access the raw parameters. For this, you'll need to hit the effects control tab, then click on your master clip effects tab. This will now allow you to adjust a range of raw settings. You can choose your image pipeline, which really you want to keep at IPP2. You have denoising, which is chroma and is a good option if you're just working within Premiere. You can then change the color space, gamma curve and ISO. You can then adjust your exposure, which allows you to go from minus eight to plus eight, an auto balance button, and then your white balance, Kelvin and tint. Next, you have a 3D light import and then the color decision list, your curves and contrast, and then your output transform settings. Here you can choose your output tone map. We usually use medium on this and then highlight roll off, which does what it says. You can tweak the roll off in a range of presets, very soft, soft, medium and hard. We usually use soft or very soft here. Having these presets available to choose from is awesome and makes achieving a nice grade fairly quick. You then have your output color space and gamma curve. Once you've tweaked what you want, you can then save your tweaks to the RMG sidecar. One other little tip that we use regularly is the ability to copy and paste your raw tweaks across an entire set of clips. Take this B-roll footage. If I make some tweaks, you can then copy this by right clicking on the FX title, copy, go into your bin where all your R3D clips are, select them all, and then hit Control V, Command V or paste. This will apply these tweaks onto all the selected clips which is great if you're batch processing stuff that looks fairly similar. We use a Red Gemini as our primary B-roll camera. So that means we process R3D on a very regular basis. And with all the other cameras that we shoot with, we've shot and edited a lot of different formats. R3D is one of our favorites to process, if not our favorite. Whether you want to quickly adjust your raw settings to correct your image and do minor color tweaks in Premiere or fully correct and color in Resolve, it feels at home and the images you can capture with Red's cameras are fantastic. With the Komodo, Red also released a range of their own creative LUTs. The camera itself has four of these LUTs in camera. Now these LUTs are a Chromic, Film Bias, Film Bias Bleach Bypass, and Film Bias Offset. These have been designed to give the camera more of a look than the normal neutral red image. If you want to get these into your post workflow, you can either export them 
off of the camera onto your CFOS card, or we've created a link in our bio where you can download them from. Let us know which one you like the best in the comments below. Back in January, Red also released a set of 28 IPP2 creative LUTs, which you can either import into the camera or enter any program that can handle cube LUTs. Links for those are in the description as well. So that was our first look at the Red Komodo. As I said at the beginning, we couldn't formulate one of our larger in-depth reviews, so make sure you keep your eyes peeled for part two, which will feature everything that we've missed. The Red Komodo has been incredibly hyped up, and for the most part, it does live up to that hype, but it does have an awful lot of competition out there. However, if you're wanting a B or C camera for your existing DSMC2 system, want to experience the Red ecosystem for the first time at a more reasonable investment point, or are looking for your first cinema camera and want a camera with fantastic color, solid dynamic range, and the best raw codec on the market, Komodo is a fantastic choice. Let us know what you think of the Red Komodo and what content you want to see us create with it in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and make sure you hit the subscribe button. If you have any other questions, let us know and thank you for watching.